All right, well, thank you. Thanks for the uh, opportunity to present our work today. There we are. So um, one of the first analysis challenges when you sequence a new cohort of cancer patients is to identify significantly mutated genes that are mutated in more patients than you would expect by chance. Um, this is not such an easy task. There's many subtleties. A number of individuals in this room had developed very sophisticated methods for doing this statistical test appropriately on a gene-by-gene -gene basis and then applied these tests to TCGA and other large uh, data sets, thereby identifying a number of significantly mutated genes. And I put a, a, a list of a, a few of the more recent studies from TCGA. And, uh, while these genes seem to be enriched for cancer-causing genes, these do not seem to be the complete list of cancer genes in these samples. These lists are relatively short, and what I'm not showing you is the long tail of genes that are mutated at, you know, modest or rare frequencies, but don't pass this, this threshold of, of statistical significance that uh, one would use. Now, there's many reasons for, for this mutational heterogeneity, but one of them is that genes don't act on their own, but rather act together in pathways. And when you look in, at the mutations in uh, known pathways, you indeed see such clustering of mutations in pathways. Again, showing you some examples from, from some of the TCGA uh, studies, and thereby showing that we can recover some of the cancer-causing genes by knowing something about the biology and looking at how they interact with, with other genes. But as the data sets get larger, my group has been interested in or developing ideas that allow us to drill a little deeper into the data, not restrict ourselves to only known pathways, but, but rather to sort of reduce the amount of prior knowledge we put into the analysis, thereby possibly identifying novel pathways or crosstalk between pathways or, or perhaps use something about the, the topology of these, these interactions. So, of course, as we reduce the, the amount of prior knowledge and perhaps go to, you know, a, a noisy whole genome interaction network or even try to look at all combinations of genes and whether or not they're significantly mutated, we're going to face this statistical problem of increasing the number of hypotheses. So it would be very hard to obtain statistical significance if we couldn't even do it for a single gene. So we've developed a couple of algorithms that allow us to uh, use some, some additional information and some tricks to, to, kind of, to get this statistical robustness. First, you're looking at subnetworks of an interaction network, an algorithm called Hotnet, or, or alternatively, going sort of deeper into this no prior knowledge, but we use this notion of mutual exclusivity. I'm just going to tell you today about Hotnet. And to just briefly uh, recap what the goal is, so we assume that we've uh, taken our mutation data, collapsed it at the level of genes. We have a whole genome interaction network um, in a very simplistic format here where we've got genes or proteins and an edge between two genes. If there's some known interaction between them, we could, of course, use varying amounts of prior knowledge in constructing such a network. I'll tell you the ones we use in the analysis in, in a couple of minutes. And so the goal is to then identify connected subnetworks that are mutated in more patients than we expect. So you can see how this sort of generalizes a little bit this idea of looking at known pathways, where if we think of this network as, say, the superposition of all known pathways, then we're sort of simultaneously trying to pick apart these pathways, but allow for crosstalk or interactions between them, or perhaps novel subnetworks that we don't know uh, uh, a priori. So in developing such a method, there are really two, two components, and there's this interaction between these, these two ideas that needs to be dealt with. One is that, you know, genes can be significant on their own. Uh, they have, you know, a, a frequency mutation or perhaps some score, maybe some significant score that you use, um, as well as the topology of the interactions between them. So we'd like to identify, for example, cases where the individual genes might not be significant on their own. They're mutated at moderate or rare frequencies, but they're very highly connected. Um, and perhaps distinguish those from cases where we do have genes that are, you know, connected to each other. Maybe they're even highly mutated or highly significant, but that connection is through perhaps some high degree node, which isn't so surprising then that we would find such a connection. And biological networks have this sort of uneven topology. So we need to simultaneously account for both mutation frequency or score and the network topology. So one way we can model this has this nice physical interaction that I could describe as um, thinking of, of the uh, um, mutations as sources of heat on the graph. So the idea here is that we have this interaction network. We heat up the genes in proportion to their frequency or their mutation score or some notion of significance at the gene level. Here you can use you know, a variety of different scores. And then that encodes the mutation part. And then to encode the topology, it allows that heat to diffuse over the edges. So this encodes both the local topology not just nearest neighbors, but neighbors of neighbors, and it does this in a very continuous way. 
So now we have this distribution of heat on the graph. So how do we get the subnetworks? Well, we need to break it apart. And the way we break it is, is by removing cold edges. And then we have to do a statistical test on top of that, which I, I won't describe, but has is, is been published previously. So, so that's HotNet. And in this study, what we wanted to do was apply HotNet in, in the pan-cancer setting, so to go across multiple cancer types. And the idea here was that what we would like to find in doing so is perhaps you know, universal subnetworks that were mutated across all cancer types, maybe sort of with equal frequency, frequency somehow, or, or perhaps uh, ones that were mutated in only a subset of, of cancer types, or maybe even cases where you know, the subnetwork itself is mutated across all cancer types, but the individual genes within that subnetwork are mutated with some cancer type-specific bias. Okay, so we didn't know which, if any, of these things would, would arise, and so we um, decided to, to go and look. And the story I'd like to tell you for the next six minutes or so is that we took a very noisy interaction network and we took all the mutation and copy number data, threw it into HotNet, and, and magically we got the, uh, the right subnetworks. Unfortunately, although the algorithm is nice, it, it doesn't yet perform magic. We can't take all mutation data and copy number data. There's just too much noise there. So we have to do a little bit of filtering. We try to do as little as possible. So for single nucleotide variants, we don't have to restrict to just significantly mutated genes. We can go really far into this this, this uh, distribution, if you will. Uh, here we used a cutoff of only 0.8% frequency of mutation, um, and, and that uh, reduced some you know, uh, really low, lowly frequent, low frequency mutations. Copy number aberrations, of course, are much, much trickier because they tend to be large. They include many genes, and really identifying the target gene is a, is a really difficult challenge. Um, and, and we, we uh, ended up using uh, gistic max peaks that were, were predicted for the individual cancer types and, and then merged those together in a, in a pan-cancer analysis. The, the interaction network, though, we are able to use sort of a very noisy interaction network, as I'll show you. So with some modest filtering on the mutation, Here's, here's what we obtained. So in total, uh, 1,984 samples across nine different cancer types here. Colorectal I've combined as one. Breast cancer I've split into four expression subtypes. So there's a number of sample, samples, samples of each type. And uh, 765 genes after we remove these lowly, uh, low frequency mutated genes. You'll see you know, some of the usual suspects have either high uh, SNP, uh, single nucleotide frequency or high copy number uh, frequency there. But then there's also sort of this big schmear of, of, of genes that you know, are very low frequency. So the first interaction network is a very noisy one. It's this IREF index, 200,000 interactions uh, over a about 14,000 proteins. This, this sort of incorporates as a, lot of a lot of different interaction databases, um, so it has a lot of you know, false positives, presumably also a lot of false negatives. Note that there's no sort of temporal context here or subtype context, so this really is you know, a, a very noisy thing. But uh, we were able to pull out 11 subnetworks with at least th three genes, and the p-value is, is at least uh, 10 to the minus 2. We haven't sort of finished all the uh, permutation tests, presumably much lower um, than that. So here's a, a list of, of these subnetworks, sub um, and I'm going to show you a few in the next uh, a few slides, but you know, not surprisingly, you know, some of the usual suspects, again, P53 signaling, PIK3CA, EGFR and other receptors, RB1. Uh, this is a, a DNA damage subnetwork that I'll show you, uh, uh, P10 cohesin, I'll, I'll show you in a second, as well as a, a few others. So just to sort of show you some of the data, it's sort of a very dense plot. So here's the genes, their frequencies across the different subtypes, color-coded by subtype, as well as whether it's a single nucleotide variant or an amplification in that sample. Um, this is a PIK3CA and, and, and RAS. Um, what we also do is we sort of compute whether there's enrichment for individual cancer types in this subnetwork. Work. These p-values you should take with a grain of salt because we have thrown out some of the mutations. We filtered the mutations, but it does show at least uh, some trend of, of maybe some cancer-specific bi uh, biases in these subnetworks. And then we also do uh, see whether these conditional on the number of mutations in this cancer type, whether there's any gene-specific biases. Here you see that NRAS is sort of preferentially mutated in, uh, in, in AML, um, while uh, KRAS is, is preferentially mutated in, in colorectal. Uh, the luminal A subtype of breast cancer with a PIK3CA mutation. Um, I wanted to also note that you know there is a strong pattern of mutual exclusivity, but there's also co-occurrence that's allowed here. And in fact, although uh, PIK3CA and the RAS uh, uh, genes are, are, are often thought to be mutually exclusive, there is some evidence that they do co-occur in particular samples, and we see that here in endometrial and colorectal. <clears throat> 
Uh, here's this, this DNA repair uh, network, same, same type of story here, centered on BRCA1. Uh, these these uh, two genes here are actually uh, Fanconia, Fanconia anemia genes, which are uh, uh, genes that uh, infer a, a, a genetic predisposition to this uh, DNA instability uh, disease. So it's sort of nice to find them here, very rarely mutated, would not be sort of found on their own and seem to be across cancer types, although there is some enrichment for, for breast cancer and ovarian for this subnetwork. Here's, here's cohesin, which falls out, um, and in fact, we get the subnetwork is, is, is exactly the cohesin genes and, and no more. Five, so this is the, the canonical cohesin complex involved in sister chromatin adhesion as, as well as more recently seems to be implicated in more general gene expression. Um, uh, 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 roles. Um, we see, uh, again, some gene-specific uh, gene biases for, for, uh, in AML and, and uh, a little bit in GBM for individual uh, parts of the cohesin complex and, and perhaps some cancer-specific biases in, in different breast cancer subtypes for this complex. Uh, another one really fast, these uh, polycomb group uh, genes. This uh, subnetwork has a, a few sort of uh, strange things that are driven by copy number, but what we do see here is this two components are this of this PR dub complex uh, involving BAP1 and, and AX. ASXL1, uh, gene specific, a uh, little bit of gene specific tendencies uh, for mutation in ASXL1. BAP1, of course, uh, recently shown to be an important gene in, in renal cell carcinoma, so not surprisingly, there is a, a kidney cancer enrichment for this subnetwork. Um, we then went and did another run on an additional uh, interaction network. This one is a little more focused, tends to be literature curated interactions. Um, so a smaller number of interactions here, only about 40,000. Uh, we pull out uh, a larger number of subnetworks, 20 with at least three genes. Again, a good p-value. Here's the list of those. Many of them are the same or similar, not uh, you know, exactly the same, but, but similar type of story. Um, here's one with ARID1A and PBRM1 that I didn't note before. This is actually a version of this uh, is, is currently um, uh, in, 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 in Kirk, and this was identified mostly in kidney cancer. Uh, Notch uh, was in the OV uh, manuscript identified by Hotnet. And here's a, a, a nice one that, that's new, slit robo-signaling. Um, uh, here it is. We see, again, most of the, the slit. We see both the slit ligand, the robo-receptor, and this uh, SIRGAP1, the rho GTPA. So we're getting sort of the complete um, part of, of, of this uh, a signaling uh, network. Um, not, not too much enrichment here across cancer types, seems to be sort of across um, uh, different types of cancers except for AML, hardly any, anything in AML in, uh, in, in slit robo. Um, interestingly, we were sort of doing this analysis a couple of months ago without knowledge of a, a paper that, of course, many of you now know, some in the audience contributed to this paper uh, that came out in Nature just two weeks ago that highlights slit robo-signaling as important in pancreatic cancer. Um, again, some of uh, these, these same genes, although uh, also including robo-3 in that analysis. So we're pulling this out of the TCGA data types, again, purely computationally, not in any directed fashion, and so we sort of view this as, in some sense, a, a validation of our computational predictions. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude, and I'll just uh, say that, you know, in summary, we, we, we took HotNet, which had been previously applied on individual cancer types. We applied it in this pan-cancer setting. We uncovered some evidence, for perhaps, you know, these, these individual types of things that could happen, a little bit of gene specificity, nothing, of course, this dramatic where the gene is exclusive to a cancer type, but perhaps some, some such tendencies. Uh, of course, there's only a, a first, you know, analysis. Um, the mutation data needs a, a lot more QC. We're still struggling a little bit with copy number aberrations and how to do that. Those, um, uh, get uh, better background models for the, the single nucleotide variants. Um, we haven't done anything with expression, and of course it's important to incorporate expression. Uh, uh, methylation, we, we, we'd also love to incorporate um, as well, but you know, each of these data types uh, requires it, itself some, some analysis. You, know, you can't just all go into the, the, the algorithm and, and, and pull out the magic. Dendrix I didn't uh, describe for mutual exclusivity, so that you know, will be a, a something to come. And I'll conclude with the acknowledgments. Uh, my group, Fabio Medina, Ali Ufa, all my colleagues contributed a lot to the, uh, the algorithmic developments, and my students, Max Leiserson Max Leiser and Sintai Wu, have been doing a lot of the analysis. For the AML data, we've been working a lot with the, uh, the AML group at, at WashU, and, and um, I didn't describe the AML results in particular, but that curated data went into this analysis. The algorithms are available. We encourage you to download and use them if you'd like. We'd also be happy to collaborate and, and, and uh, work with you in, in tuning them to your analyses. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Questions? Thank you. Matthew? Sure. So, um, Ben, really fascinating talk. I think one of the really interesting things is you know, this sort of novel generation of 
uh, new candidate pathways, yeah. uh, which looks like it's you know, corresponding in some cases to you know, other recent studies. And I just wonder if you have a vision of how to um, move from definition to validation of these pathways uh, through orthogonal data sets, which would um, both you know, bring more power to the approach and also um, uh, allow you to refine it. I mean, in brief, I, I, I get asked that question. I don't have a good answer. I'm not an ex experimentalist. Um, uh, we, we'd love to validate some of our predictions. We've talked to individuals about um, ways we might do that. It's, it's a tricky business because, uh, you know, there's, there's all sorts of crosstalk between these, and we pick out one component, and, and the experiment that you would do that would say it's somehow the pathway or the subnetwork that's important as opposed to the individual genes is, is, is a challenge. So. Um, I'm likely, I mean, you, you, I'm sure, could give a better answer that, than I could for, for how to do this, and I'd love to sort of talk to you about it more offline. But. If I had a better answer, I wouldn't ask this question. <laughs> <laughs> One more. Yeah, computationally speaking, I think this is a very nice model. It's very similar to the, like, uh, when, they, when people analyze the gene regulatory network across different species and also, like, a protein protein interaction network. So, the mod, regarding to the model, the, on the graph model side, so since this will be handling very large graph, right? Yeah. So that is a very large, huge graph. Uh, I think a specific graph property, like uh, related to small degree, or yeah. even like a trivial approach could be applied to kind of uh, improve the efficiency side. Uh, sure. So um, yes, the, the graph is, is, is large. It's really not that large when you talk to people that do you know, internet graphs and stuff. Um, the, 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 this heat, heat diffusion um, encodes a lot of the types of things you're talking about in terms of small degree and you know, small worlds, power law, all that type of business. Um, it, it, it's, you know, in, in many of the approaches that look at those type of graph topologies can be modeled in terms of the heat diffusion or random walk. I mean, they're really just different ways of looking at the, the same types of things. Yeah, especially for the small sub yeah. networkers, like a Trivis approach. Yeah, would yeah. Be very no, I mean, there, there is some, um, some issue of, of, of scaling that we're running into that as we make the, as the data sets grow so that the difference between the highly mutated genes like P53 and the low mutated genes that, that you know, difference gets larger and larger, then you know, there do become some issues in how you deal with that sort of difference in scale. And, and that's something that's come out of this pan-cancer analysis that we hadn't really had to address before when we had 200 samples. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, ben, thank you. I think, I, unfortunately, we have to move on. <laughs>